So, over to Oscar. Thank you. <coughs> okay, hello everyone. I see some familiar faces from my classes, and I see some unfamiliar faces. Welcome all. Today is the first one of our meetups, and hope it will all go well. And basically, we'll be talking about shutter speed today, and how we can use it effectively. That's perfect, that's better. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's a bit more romantic with all the flowers and everything. Looking good. So, before I do anything else, I'm going to start talking about photography a bit more in general. Starting from the very basic, when I say DSLR, do you all know what it means? I mean, really what it means? Who knows what DSLR stands for? Who doesn't know what DSLR stands for? Who's listening? <laughs> Okay, DSLR, when we talk about DSLR, we're talking about digital single lens reflex. Okay, let's break it down a little. So it's digital because it doesn't use a film, it uses a chip. So that's the easy part. And it's a single lens reflex. At this point, you may be thinking, well, of course it's a single lens, what else? Well, it's a single lens as opposed to a twin lens reflex. And before, I'll quickly show you this, before they introduced the SLRs, they used to use cameras that looked more or less like this. So this is a twin lens reflex. Uh, what this did was uh, let the photographer view the image using the upper lens and the film get exposed through the lower lens. So a couple of problems there you may have noticed. One, and the biggest one, is this thing called parallax error. And I don't know if that rings any bell in anyone's heads, but that means that they can't share the same focal point. And for that reason, okay, you can imagine this being, you can imagine this upper lens being my eyes and this lower lens being my mouth, for example. And uh, I'm viewing the things with my eyes. So if I'm shooting this pen and I'm using my eyes as to, to view it, my mouth is looking at something else. So as soon as I press the shutter, I'm going to be uh, exposing a different image than what I'm seeing. That was the kind of the biggest letdown of this camera, if you like. I mean, it did have some advantages. It was a bit quieter than the SLR, which came on later on. Then it used a different type of shutter. Most of them, apart from a few exceptions, I think, they uh, didn't use a zoom lenses either. So they had really disadvantages and a little bit advantages to them. So they, clever people, came up with an idea of letting the photographer see exactly what the lens was looking at. And that's where the SLR part came in play, if you like. And I'm going to try and show you this. Okay, let's go back to here. So basically what happens inside your camera with this SLR type. So this is, a, this is an everyday camera that you hopefully hold in, in your hands. So this is the camera itself. And I'll show you that this is the inside of your camera. So you've got a set of lenses here. Um, and you've got a little hole here called the aperture. It's a posh way of calling the hole in, in your camera. It's an aperture. And the red ones here are mirrors. So this is an SLR camera, single lens reflex. Keep that in mind. So the red parts here are mirrors. And at the back, you have your film or your chip. In front of this chip, you would uh, normally have a shutter mechanism. A, um, most of the times, it would be a focal plane shutter in these cameras. And what happens inside your camera when you press the shutter button is this. And this also is the thing that allows you as the photographer to see exactly what the lens is looking at. So the light, this uh, yellow little line here, imagine that's the light, would be going through your lens, through the aperture, through that hole, and it would be hitting the first mirror. And at this point, it's not good for anything. But what happens there is this is a 45 degree mirror. It reflects the light all the way up to this uh, panther prism here. And once the light is reflected up there, it goes from this top mirror to this mirror here. So if I move forward a little. And you as the photographer are actually looking at this mirror and you're looking at the reflection of this light coming through the lens and hitting this set of mirrors here. That's actually how you can see, so it goes forward like this, that's actually how you can see exactly what the lens is looking at. So the disadvantage to TLR, the twin lens reflex, was that you were looking at something else. So it wouldn't be a problem probably if you were doing like landscape or um, a long shot, but if, as soon as it became a mid shot or a close up, then you'd see this uh, parallax uh, error. 
So, as soon as you press the shutter button on your camera, what happens is, and this is also the reason why, as soon as you press the shutter button, it goes black for a blink of an eye. You can't see anything. The reason for that is, as soon as you press the shutter button, this first mirror here flips up, so it goes up. By doing this, and this focal plane shutter opens up there as well, so by doing that, it lets the film, or the chip, get exposed as well. And Hence, you can't see anything anymore because the mirror has changed its position. And as soon as the exposing is over, what happens is the mirror flips back down. So it lets you see what the lens is looking at again. If you were ever wondering, why am I not seeing anything as I take a photograph? This is the reason. As soon as you press the shutter button, uh, the mirror flips up. And this is also the reason if you ever were to use the live, me uh, live view mode on your camera, so you can see exactly through the LCD at the back. And if you try and look through the viewfinder as the LCD is active, you can't really see much, I can't really see anything, because this mirror is flipped up so that the chip can see and show what it's seeing uh, on the LCD. Okay, so this is actually what's going on inside your camera as you press the shutter button. So I'm going to move on now and talk about a little, a little more about exposure before I jump into shutter speed specifically. So I'm going to close this up and let's go back here. Okay, that's looking good. There you go. Exposure, when we, when we talk about exposure, we're talking about how bright or how dark the image is on, on, on your medium. So it could be your film, your chip. And shutter speed is one of them, which affects exposure. And there's two more. Uh, one is aperture. I won't go into details on those, but I'll quickly mention what they are. And the other one is ISO. So aperture, you can think of aperture as that hole I was talking about. It's simply a hole that controls how much light gets into your camera. Okay? So you can think of aperture like your pupils in your eye. Okay? And shutter speed is responsible for controlling the duration of that light hitting your chip or your film. So as soon as you press the shutter button, that mirror flips up and the shutter opens. And the duration in which the shutter stays open is your shutter speed. So you and you can think of shutter speed as your eyelids, for example. So if your pupils would be the aperture, your eyelids would be the shutter speed. As you blink, you can think of uh, that as the shutter speed. And ISO, which again I won't talk about m in much detail, is the sensitivity of your chip or your film. And I guess you can think of that as, I don't know, how old you are. So as you get older, uh, your eyes become less and less sensitive to light. Uh, so that may be your ISO. Um, all of the factors here affect how bright or dark your image will be. And today we'll be talking specifically about shutter speed. So we'll ignore the aperture and ISO. Maybe we can do another meetup for those another time. But let's talk about uh, shutter speed specifically for now. Shutter speed is measured in seconds, or rather milliseconds. So we'd be talking about maybe a second, half a second, quarter of a second, eighth of a second, five seconds, a day, whichever you wish. So we'll be talking about time when we say shutter speed. And it is measured in seconds. You also get on your cameras, you get uh, different options as well. So on, on the cameras, you also get the B option, which stands for bulb. And it lets you uh, control the shutter manually. So as long as you hold the shutter button down, your camera will expose light, it will expose your film or chip to light for the duration. Or you'll also sometimes have this mode called T mode, which stands for time. And that will let you press once, it will open the shutter. You can go have a coffee or something, come back, press one more time, and it will close the shutter. So those are the two, two modes. So what is shutter speed? What, why do I care? Well, shutter speed affects one thing and one thing only, and it affects motion blur. Used wisely, it could create beautiful images. Um, if you don't know what it does, and if you don't know how to use it, you can mess up your, your pictures. I'll go forward now and zoom out here a little. OK. So as I, oops. So when I say motion blur, what I mean actually is motion blur. So I'm talking about motion blur, not camera shake. I'll talk about camera shake in a short while. But this is what I mean by motion blur. So here you have a car, for example. This was, I think, about a second. Uh, it was exposed for a second, so my shutter speed was about a second. So as soon as I press the shutter button down, the first car, the, the car at the back here, was at this point. And during that one second period, it moved all the way down to here. That's why we get motion blur. 
So if you look at like some of the people here on the on, on here, they appear like ghosts. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly. So you just see a foot there or a leg or just that random head. That's because it may be ghost. It may be. It may well be real ghosts. But that is because uh, during that um, exposure, they kept moving. And that gives us motion blur as well. And the key here is to keep your camera still and let everything else, if, if they're moving, move. So as long as you keep your camera still, you can see that most of my image here, like this is sharp here, you can read clearly, and most of the people here are sharp, but only the things that are moving are blurry. And so this is motion blur and not camera shake, and camera shake is something like this. So if everything is blurry, uh, not out of focus, but blurry, because out of focus is something else. If everything is blurry, that means your shutter speed was set to something of a low value, and you couldn't hold your camera still during the exposure. Hence, everything appears to be blurry. So this shouldn't be confused with motion blur. Motion blur and camera shake are completely different things. But the only reason you get either of them is shutter speed. Okay? I won't go into like technical camera uh, uh, settings uh, and stuff, but for those who are interested, uh, if you want to use your camera on a shutter priority mode, you will have a little wheel on, the on top of the camera, and it will either say, for Nikon users, it will say S, which stands for shutter priority, and for Canon users, and yeah, it's just for Canon, I think, it's, it says TV, which stands for time value, and I think for most other cameras, it, it's S as well. And what that does, if you set your shooting mode to S or TV, what that does is it lets you control the shutter speed and it, de it determines the aperture according to that. So you can't really talk about shutter speed or aperture on their own or ISO. So they all work in tandem, like that triangle I just showed you. So you have to, you have to make sure they're all set to the right values. Uh, but I, like I said, I won't really go into that now. What I want to show you is, so what, what, what does it do? What does shutter speed actually properly do? So this is a shot I took from a, a, a film set. And here my shutter, I think it was this one, let's have a look. Yeah. Here my shutter was set to 50th of a second. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about aperture or ISO. It was set to 50th of a second. Like I said, we measure uh, shutter speed in, in seconds or fractions of a second. So the only thing I want you to... Uh, have a look here is this little explosion now, not very little, but this explosion here that's going on. So this is 50th of a second and I'm going to show you another image now so we can compare. You can see not very clearly that stuff is happening here. So it just looks like a blur. So this is motion blur as well. So you can see my image is sharp enough so the still objects like, like this uh, log here or the slow, slowly moving soldiers, they are sharp. But if anyone's moving really fast like this guy here, or like this explosion, they appear to be blurry. Uh, keep in mind, this is 50th of a second. So when I press the shutter button, that, that mirror goes up and down, and this happens um, during 50th of a second. If I change my shutter settings from 50th of a second to 100th of a second, which will uh, half the amount of light, so as you jump, uh, if you don't like the term, as you jump by one click on your camera using the wheel or the other settings, you'll actually make your image brighter or darker by a stop, they're called stops. And if you jump one click to the right, for example, you'll make your image uh, brighter, uh, you'll, you'll make your image twice as bright, or if you go the other way, you'll make your image half as bright. So I'm gonna show you another example here. I'm gonna show you another image of the same uh, setting, and this time it will, be sh it will be hundredth of a second, so there's less time, hence it's going to be darker, slightly. But this time you can actually see it's, it's more or less the same exp uh, explosion, but this time you can actually see the bits and pieces coming from the earth because that duration when I opened the shutter and closed it is a lot faster. So it's not going like this, but it's going like that. So it's capturing everything a little bit sharper. But if you don't compensate using your aperture or your ISO, what you'll end up with is a darker image. So, okay, you'll get a sharper image, but darker. So I'm going to compare these two now. So. The one on the, on the right here was the 50th of a second one. You can see it's a little brighter. It may be a little bit difficult to see here, but I think the best reference would be the sky. If you look at the tiny sky here, it's almost white. Okay? And if you look here, the sky is a lot bluer. You can't really see clearly on, on, the, on the projector. But on my screen, it looks, uh, it looks quite clear. 
And, but the better uh, kind of clue there is that the explosion, although it's the same explosion, in this one, it looks a lot sharper. This is why you would use, a, for example, a faster shutter speed as opposed to a slower one. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. Let's see again. And again. So, using fast shutter speed, like relatively fast shutter speed, you can freeze motion. So imagine someone there, someone over there is taking a photograph of me walking that way. Okay? And imagine I'm really slow. So I'm walking like this. I'm walking like this. And you set your camera to, for example, expose the image for two seconds. Okay? So I start here, and you press the shutter, and I keep walking, and after two seconds, I end up here. What happens is your camera captures me here, and it captures me here, and here, and here, and here. So I end up as a, as a blur. But if, you, if it was the same setting, same light, lighting conditions, everything else, rather than having two seconds, if you had 125th of a second, for example, so a lot faster, you would either capture me here, or here, or here, or any of the other positions. As soon as you press the shutter, it will capture me there. So there is a little chance I'll appear blurry. Unless I really try hard, I can't really move faster than 125th of a second. So this is exactly what I did with this image here. So I set my uh, shutter speed to something of a high value. So let's check, actually. It's actually a thousandth of a second. It says here. Again, this, there's no set rules for this. I can't tell you if you set your aperture to, uh, if you set your shutter speed to this amount, it will give you sharp results. But as a rule of thumb, I'd say if you're shooting um, people, if you go anywhere below 125th of a second, you're in the gray area. So you may get blurry images depending on how fast they move. You may get blurry images or depending on how much you shake your camera. So anything about 125th of a second should do the trick if you want to freeze a normal person. In this case, I was shooting a horse. So, I mean, I was taking a photograph of a horse. And, <laughs> and obviously, the horse was moving a lot faster than a normal human being. That's why I had to set my shutter speed to something of a higher value. This horse here was training for some dressage. So it wasn't galloping, it wasn't going really fast. That's why a thousand of a second was enough. But if, if it was like going really fast, I would have to set my shutter speed to a higher value. OK, I'll show you a couple more examples. This one here, a beloved friend. Um, I think this one was even more. Yes, this is here is a sixteen hundredth of a second. Okay, although he's not moving faster than the uh, horse. Well, I hope he wasn't. It's it, sometimes it's tricky to capture it, even even if you if you're not too fast. Sometimes it's a, a little bit tricky to capture a movement. So to make sure, I set my uh, camera to shutter priority mode. And I said, OK, set my shutter speed to uh, 1,600 of a second. So whatever he does, he's not going to be faster than that. And my camera set the aperture accordingly. And let's actually check what the aperture was for this. So my camera set the aperture to 5.8. And it gave me a perfect exposure. And I could, doing this, I could freeze motion. Uh, so whenever I actually press the shutter button, I could freeze it then. So I didn't have to worry about uh, you know, him being blurry or me having a camera shake. So, next I'm going to show you this as well. Sometimes you can bring, up, uh, bring down your aperture value to, to its maximum. So it can be really, really small, but it just won't be enough. If you're shooting something really bright, like the sun, it doesn't get brighter than that. And even if you set your ISO, your film sensitivity, your chip sensitivity to something of a really low value, you frame it well and everything else. If you, if you try and take a picture, this is a tricky photograph to take. If you ever try this, Either everything is going to be washed out, or you're going to get really kind of weird artifacts like flares and stuff coming from the sun itself. So then what you would need to do is, if your aperture and ISO is not enough, set your shutter speed to something of a really high value. So let's check what I did here. So this is 4,000th of a second, uh, I can see here. My aperture was also set to uh, uh, 29, which is really, really a tiny, tiny hole uh, in my lens. So that hole was, I think, the, m the maximum I could go up to, but that just wasn't enough. So I had to do this. And if you frame it well, there's, there's a little Photoshop on this to uh, get rid of the noise a little bit, but that's more or less it, really. If you frame it well, you can even shoot the sun like this without any problems. And I was told this actually looks like an eye a couple of days ago, and I was like, hmm, it actually does. I'm going to move on. I'm going to 
we'll move from here as well. Now, that's, that's if you use fast shutter speed. What if you want to use slower shutter speed? Everyone here may be thinking, well, of course I want to use fast shutter speed and not get any blurry images uh, like, like this one. So why wouldn't I? Well, sometimes it's good uh, not to use fast shutter speed. And I'll give you a few examples. And I think the, kind of the most famous one you might have seen is making water look like silk. For this, if you set your camera uh, to a lower shutter speed, so it's taking kind of its time, if you like, to expose the image, and make sure you either have a tripod or uh, somewhere to kind of lean onto so you, you don't shake your camera. I was actually told today by Mark Getter, uh, one of the trainers in, in, our, in our company, I was actually told by him today a really cool new technique. What he said, if you don't have a tripod and you can't keep your hand still for, I don't know, for, for a certain time, what you can do, find a piece of string, and at this point I went, you mean a string? And he said, a string? And I said, go on. Then he said, tie the string to your uh, foot. And I was like, are we still on the same page? And he said, yes. And he said, tie the other end to the camera. I was like, OK. Then he said, just push up as much as you can so the string uh, has, has attention to it. And that way, he said he was able to use a second uh, for his shutter setting. So he, he, he was able to keep his camera still for a second uh, using a piece of string attached to his foot and the camera. Try it if you have any time, and you can let me know if it works. I'm going to try it next time. Maybe, yeah, that was on Blue Peter as well. <laughs> but anyway, at this case, uh, I didn't have a, a piece of string. I probably could have. It would have been easier to carry it. This is in Italy. Um, what I did was I set my shutter speed to, let's have a look, 20th of a second. So it will give me enough blur on, on any moving subject. And I made sure that I wasn't moving, so the camera wasn't moving. And the only thing in my photograph that was moving was the water. For that reason, the water appears to be blurry. So it looks beautiful here, but it's actually blurry. If, if you were asking, well, why would I want to use blurry images, you may want to use it, well, for an image like this, if you want to get it. So I'm, I have a couple of more examples with water. So this is shots, again, in the same place this was. The shutter speed here was, again, a four thousandth of a second. So it was really quick. And what I did then, I changed my shutter speed to a really low value and I adjusted my aperture and my ISO to compensate. Otherwise, if I just change it to a low value, it would just be brighter. And by low value, I mean really low value. And if I check this, so this is the same image with a lower shutter speed, slower shutter speed. And this is half a second, as you can see on the right here. So we have half a second and we have four thousandth of a second. And obviously, like I said, if you just leave the rest of the settings as they are, if you're in manual mode, this is, if you leave the rest of the settings as they are, half a second is going to expose the image for click, click, and 4,000 of a second is going to expose the image like that. For that, it would be a lot darker, so you would need to go to your uh, aperture or your ISO settings to compensate. So I'm going to see here to compare. So the one on the right here is, is with a really high uh, shutter speed, so it's really fast shutter speed. And the one on the left is with a really low shutter speed. And the key here is to use a tripod or you won't, you, you'll get a blurry image. Okay, so do use a tripod when you can. Um, I've got a couple of more examples. Okay, let's check this one out. Okay, so this here um, was shot with a um, little bit more than uh, half a second. So it's 0.6 seconds. And again, you can see... I'll show you a better example than this, actually, with a tree involved uh, in it as well. But again, you can see here is, I mean, this wasn't anywhere as bright as my eye could see it. So this was quite dark when I put the camera on the tripod and pressed the shutter button. My eye couldn't see the scenery as well as my camera did. So I set my shutter speed to a relatively slower value. And what happens here is you get everything that stays still in focus. So in this case, the tree, but not just the whole tree, but part of the tree, which is kind of this lower part here, is sharp. If you look above here, because it was a little windy night, you can see it was moving around, the branches were moving around, and for that reason, you actually get this motion blur. Everything else that is uh, stationary in this image appears sharp. Okay? The background doesn't appear sharp, that's not because the background was moving or anything, that's because of my aperture setting, so I had a shallow depth of field. Next up. Um, 
again, this one, when I, when I looked at the scenery with my eyes, it looked nice, but I couldn't see it as bright as this. So what I did is, I think this was two seconds or something. Yeah, this is two seconds here. So I set my camera to two seconds, and I put my camera on tripod, and I pressed the shutter button, and after two seconds, I was like, this is actually brighter than what I can see. This one here, uh, I use this one in some of my classes as well, so if some of you may remember this if, if you attended my classes. Um, okay, this was a bit tricky. This is six seconds, five seconds this is. What I did here, I think, yeah, this has a funny story actually. What I did here was I set my tripod, I had a really cheap tripod. This, not, not this one, this is a really good tripod uh, we have here. This is Wehbi's tripod, really good one, Manfrotto. I had a really cheap, I think I bought it like for like 10 pounds or something, tripod. So it wasn't really steady at all. And you don't want a bad cheap tripod if you, if you want to be serious about night photography. So what I did was I set my tripod out in the balcony. It was a windy night, uh, but I'll come back to that. Um, so I, I, I set my camera on the tripod. I did a couple of test shots. They didn't turn out well. And eventually I figured what shutter speed I should use. And it turned out to be five seconds. I was like, fine. I just put my camera on the tripod, set it to five seconds, set my aperture on ISO. Then I just pressed the shutter button. And after five seconds, I got, I got an image which was blurry. Not out of focus or anything, but motion blurry. And I was like, hmm, that's a bit strange. Obviously, nothing was moving, so it must be my fault. So then what I realized was that it was um, a little bit windy. Okay? So even I couldn't feel it that much. Uh, your camera is really sensitive. Actually, I heard this a couple of days ago. The digital cameras that you hold in your hand, the DSLRs, I d I'm not sure how true this is, but I would be really uh, surprised if it wasn't true. Uh, the digital cameras in your hands, they have a more advanced technology than the technology they had for the first Apollo mission. So imagine that. So that little thing that you're holding in your hand is really valuable. So your camera can sense if it's moving or not, so you can't trick it. So what I did then was I was leaning on the tripod, okay, so that it wasn't, mo it wasn't getting, getting affected by the wind. So I was leaning on the tripod, then I said, okay, let's give it a go again. So I pressed the shutter button. And again, I ended up with a blurry image. I said, okay, something's wrong here. Then I realized, as I was pressing the shutter button, I was actually kind of pushing on the camera a little bit. So because it was a cheap tripod, it wasn't holding still. As I was pressing the shutter button, my camera was going down like this. Ever so slightly. I couldn't even like, properly see it with my eyes. Then I was like, aha, uh -huh, now I, I know what to do. Then I happened to have a little gadget, a remote control for my camera. And I said, well, I'll just use the remote control and just lean on the camera. And it should just be a perfect image. I took my remote control out and I set my camera. I was leaning on the camera. Then I realized, hold on, this remote control is infrared and the receiver on my camera is in front of my camera. So I said, okay, you can't, you can't defeat me, camera. So I was leaning on the camera, going all the way over the camera like this, like on the 25th floor. I just pressed the shutter on the remote control and I ended up with this image. I was like, yeah, that looks nice. Then I sat down and I said, why didn't I just use the self timer? You could, so you don't really have to have a separate um, device or anything to do this. You can actually set your camera's self-timers, so, because it will affect, it, like, at some point you'll actually see that it's not working. If you just keep trying with your shutter button and it keeps getting blurry and blurry, although you're in a tripod, you'll, you'll know that it's blurry because you're actually pressing it down and it's tilting the camera a little bit. So do use the self-timer. Self-timer is not just for I know, family photos. You put the camera there and just run back and just pose and run back again. It's actually good for doing this kind of stuff as well so that you have no contact with the camera. It helps keeping things still. Before I jump to the next image, everything, well, almost everything here appears to be sharp. Can everyone spot what's not sharp? What has motion blur? Yeah, the, the clouds are, well, the clouds were the only things that were moving. Right? That's why during the six, uh, five second period, the clouds were moving from point A to point B, and my camera was, was capturing everything. It's, I mean, although it's ever so slightly, the, the motion blur is really kind of tiny. You can still see if you look close, it's not as sharp. The clouds aren't, aren't as sharp as this building, for example. If I look at this building, it's you know, crystal sharp, but if I look at the clouds, they're moving, they're a bit blurry. Okay? What else is not clear here? Yeah, the water was also moving, so the, the river was also moving, hence we had this kind of silky look to that mirror, as, uh, to that water as well. 
So whatever is moving in your photograph will either have motion blur if you don't control it or you can freeze it if you know how to use your shutter speed properly. So as I talk about things, just keep in mind that shutter speed, when I say shutter speed, I refer back to freezing or blurring action in your photographs. I'm going to move on. Okay, this is another example. Uh, this was recently, uh, this year's bonfire night. In this one, I think this was like six seconds or something, or even thir this, this was 13 seconds. Uh, my camera was on a tripod. I made sure it wasn't moving in any way, so I was just like covering it, making people, making sure that people just couldn't, didn't touch it or anything. And I framed it. And when I framed it, the the guy there, here, and these people were obviously kind of moving around. And I said, okay, that may look quite good if they appeared like a bit blurry. Then I set it to the right uh, exposure, which, which was 13 seconds. And I pressed the shutter button. This time I had a better tripod, so I didn't uh, kind of tilt the camera down. And after 13 seconds, I ended up with an image that looked like this. So if I kind of ex examine this a little bit more, you can see here, because during the 13 second period, all the people here were moving around. So they were messing around. Like there was a little girl there. She had her head at, at point A in, to start with, then she moved around. Then she, kind of, she was leaning down and up. And this guy in front of me was moving left and right. And everybody else, they all appear blurry. The only thing that appears to be sharp here is the tree. Why? Because the tree wasn't moving. And who can guess what the bright lines are in the sky? Not the people who attended my class, because I actually use these in my classes. They would know. Who can guess what these lights, the bright kind of lines of lights are? Planes. Planes, a good one. Well, yeah, good one. But not planes. Fireworks. Almost fireworks. You know those? Uh, oh, Chinese lanterns. Yeah, Chinese lanterns that they, they light up. What happened here is when I pressed the shutter button, the lantern was here. So the lantern was here. And during the 13 second period, it moved, it moved all the way up from this position to this position. Hence, we get a blur. So again, this is actually motion blur, but because it was a bright spot in air, it just appears as a line, as a bright line. Okay? And if I zoom in, you can even see the tree was being really nice and it wasn't moving at all. So it was really, really sharp. Okay? So I'm going to zoom back out. Now, that slow shutter speed, that was uh, 13 seconds. How, there's no Photoshop, by the way, involved in this image whatsoever. How long do you think this image was exposed for? It's quite darkish, and this is just one uh, photograph. Like I said, I didn't kind of stitch anything together. That's me, by the way. If my face is too dark here, that's, that's me there. Any guesses? No, th th there's no like, you know, gimmicks or anything involved in it apart from just one flash and a camera and a tripod. This was exposed actually for uh, about 80 seconds. How is this even possible? Because like I appear there, I appear here. Again, it comes all the way down to shutter speed. So what I did was I set my camera to T mode, which uh, allowed me to press the shutter and just open it up. And I could just go back and press it again to close it. It was pitch black. So I opened the shutter up and I moved, I think it was that position to start with. I moved to that chair and I just posed as, as you do. And I had a flash in my hand, a flash gun, an external flash. I just uh, triggered the flash with the test button on it. So I just triggered the flash and everything was bright for a fraction of a second. Okay? So my camera captured it and everything was dark again. So I moved all the way to the other chair. And this time, I used a, a slower flash, so it wasn't as, as hard. And I pressed the test button again, and my camera captured it again this time. But this time on the left, I appear more, you tell me, what's the word? Ghosty, if that is a word. So there, because there was enough light and time to expose me on camera, I appear, but if you just look at this part of the image, that's not, nothing special about it. But if you look at this side, it, I'm actually kind of see through here. But you can even see the chair. Okay, and I'm not sure if you can clearly, s I can't, I don't think you can see it on that image. I'm actually going to brighten this up a little bit so you can see. There's actually one more me on the right hand side and I will show you that. That looks even more freaky, I think. So, there we go. Can you see there's one more of me here? This is, uh, actually this may be 
how they get you to believe that they're ghosts in images. You know, they say, we, we had this photograph taken and there's someone behind us and what is it? It's see-through. Well, it may well be this. It, well, you never know. And what about the... I'll zoom out. I'll go back here. And what about the little kind of specks here, the colorful specks, like here if I go left? Any idea what those might be? Dust from the flash? Mm, no. That would actually be a cool effect if, if flash just <laughs> did that. No, not dust. Any other guesses? Pardon? They are, they, they are noise, or if it's a film, they would be grain. But these, these are noise. And I actually had a lower ISO, which wouldn't give me, well, in, in theory, it shouldn't give me um, any, any noise like this. So I used a ISO 200, which is quite low. So if you ever wondered why you get noise in your images, that would be because your ISO is set to something of a higher value. So your chip is more sensitive to light, and it would end up giving you noise. But in this case, my ISO was set to 200, which is kind of low. But because I kind of exaggerated it, I kind of pushed it really hard. I exposed it for over a minute. My camera just said, that's it. I can't cope with it anymore. So here's some noise for you. So this is, this is what happens if you really push it. But it may be the look that you want to get. OK, let's move on. So this is, I'd call this super slow, if you like. Okay. And so that was kind of super uh, slow. And this is a little bit different. So this, again, this comes down to shutter speed, but it's a little bit different, this example. I, I would like to call this super fast, but that would actually be wrong, because the shutter here was, again, set to a couple of seconds. I think it was two seconds, 1.6 seconds. This is, this is not one of my images. This is an image from a guy called Desmond Downs. Here he used a uh, flash and he synchronized the flash with sound. So what he did was everything was pitch black. So he set the camera, he framed it up all well, and he used an external flash which would trigger as soon as it heard a loud uh, sound like this. So you could just go like this and the flash would trigger. And he dropped the glass on the table. And as soon as the uh, flash heard that drop, it just triggered. And the camera was uh, recording during that time when the flash went off. That's why you get, an, you get an image like this. So it could almost be called a super fast, uh, but not super fast shutter speed, but a super fast uh, synchronized flash. OK. Um, what else we got here? OK, so this is the kind of basics of uh, shutter speed, what you can do with it and what it allows you to do. Now I'll talk about a few, I think two or three. I've got two or three different examples of how we can use it a bit more effectively. So. This is all good, okay, it lets you uh, freeze motion, it lets you make water look like silk and, and whatnot, but what else can you do with it? So there are a couple of cre kind of creative uh, techniques, if you like, that you can use. One being this. Okay, this is called a zoom burst, and what happens here is you set your shutter to something of a slower value. So it would be, let's see here, maybe 20th of a second here, 6th of a second here. And normally, if it was six of a second, and if you were, if you were uh, hand-holding this camera, it would just get blurry, because I, mean, I, I, I doubt that you can hold the camera still for that, that, that time in your hand. But if you have the camera on a tripod, it will let you do a couple of more kind of crazy stuff like this as well. So what I did here was I pressed the shutter button, and as the image was getting exposed, I made sure that the subject, which was the guy there, stayed exactly in the middle of my, view, uh, of my viewfinder. And as I press the shutter button, I zoomed out. So to start with, the frame was maybe about that high on him. So as, as, as my image was getting exposed, I zoomed out. And it, because he was more or less in the same position in my viewfinder, he appears to be sharper than everything else. And it just gives you the sense of sp uh, kind of movement in the scene. Actually, nothing is moving in the, in the scene. I mean, he's not moving, the buildings are not moving. Only you as the photographer and your camera is moving. That's why you get a result like this. Okay, so it's called a zoom burst. You may find some uh, good uses for this. You may find it a bit weird, uh, but it's there. Secondly, I'll talk about the, this image here called panning. 
And I'm sure you must have heard the term pan, so you pan your camera from left to right, from right to left. What happens here is you get a subject. So this works best if the subject is moving on a kind of linear line in front of you. So if you were to shoot a bird or something, it would be quite tricky. But if you can kind of guess where the subject is going, so I knew she was going straight on the, on the road. So what I did is I set my shutter speed to something of a lower value again. And let's check, I think it was like tenth of a second here. I was following her with my camera and I made sure as much as I could that she stayed exactly at the same spot on my, uh, in my viewfinder. So even though she was moving and I was moving with her, she just stayed exactly at the same spot on the view, uh, in the viewfinder. So as soon as she reached kind of like towards in front of me, I pressed the shutter button and I kept on following her. Once the exposing was over, you end up with an image that looks like this. So if you move your camera in tandem with the subject that's moving uh, either left or right, up and down, you can make your photograph look like everything else is moving, but your subject is crystal clear. So if I took this image to a person who didn't have any, any idea about like, you know, how physics work, how you, we perceive stuff, and if I show this to him, he may be thinking, oh cool, she's standing still and everything is moving back. Okay? So this is called panning. This is actually how they do uh, some special effects as well. I had a friend who worked on, uh, on a film on Avatar. When they were filming the faces of the people, what they did is they attached a helmet-like device on their, on their heads. And they had like a little pole going kind of over the helmet. And they had a little camera attached to that. Okay, so the camera was capturing the faces so they can kind of then use it uh, in computer-generated uh, images to make the, uh, the characters, the CGI, look and act like the actors. So I guess the, they just had a camera that was like pointing right at their face. So uh, wherever they move, the camera just follows their heads in tandem with their body and their heads. So the background, you can see the background is just going, man, it was going everywhere the background, but the face was always sharp. That's because the camera moves exactly in the same pace and direction as the head was moving. Okay, so that's, that's panning. Uh, I'm coming towards the end of the session now. Ideally, you would. In this one, I didn't. I think I was a little bit lucky to get it this sharp. But ideally, you would use a tripod and just um, release the pan and just pan around like that. This is what they do, by the way, in like F1 races and you know, NASCAR races and everything. Um, so they just follow the car and they just press at the right time. I mean, obviously, she wasn't as fast as an F1 race, so it was a little bit easier for me. But Still, this is, this is the idea behind it. And if you try this, if you try it 10 times, you're probably going to fail for about 8 or 9 times. This, I, I was like waiting there for maybe I don't know, half an hour to get a decent photograph. So if you do try it and end up with a really weird blurry image, don't give up. Just try it again and try it again and try it again. I'm sure you'll get an image like this. And one last thing I'll say is now that you hopefully know what shutter speed does and how it works and when it doesn't work, what you need to do to correct it, etc. The last kind of piece of advice would be to know when to press the shutter button as well. So it's not just about what is moving, you know, how you frame it, and you just need to know when to press the shutter button. So there's one last image I have here. Um, I find this to be quite a powerful image. And this is simply because the shutter button was pressed at the correct time. I mean, I could sit down here and talk about this for half an hour, uh, but this is all because I knew when to press the shutter button. Okay? So, um, one last advice I'd say is, because like in my classes as well, sometimes people come up to me and they say, we do keep taking uh, photographs and they just end up being really bad. Okay? Uh, what do I do? Um, and I, I, tend to I, I tend to tell them that that doesn't mean the photographs are bad, but it actually means that they have some taste. So keep thinking that your photographs are bad and just take better ones. I mean, if I go back to any of the photographs that I showed you, any of these, I can just sit here and talk about how bad they are for half an hour for each photograph. So as long as you know that there is always room for improvement, that means you are doing good, I think, in terms of getting there for capturing nice photographs. And on that note, that would be it for my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Now I'm going to 
kind of give, give about five, ten minutes for people to kind of go ahead to the bar and buy a couple of drinks and maybe go to the toilet. And then I'm going to uh, call Paul King and Mehpi Koja here. And they are they're best in their business. They're really good photographers and they're trainers at academic class as well. So I'm going to call them up here and we're going to have a, a question and answer uh, session. So ask the expert session. So prepare your toughest questions for photography and you can fire at us uh, after the break in five, ten minutes. Thank you.